Conservative. Constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another amazing week here on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Thank you all so, so much for tuning in, whether you're listening on WZXI, listening on your favorite podcast platform, or watching this in the video format. I hope that you stay tuned with us all this week. We got a lot of big news to cover just today, just today on everything I'd want to cover. I would have to talk for hours on, and it's a big week, and it's definitely worth staying tuned into the Andrew Cooperator show each and every single day. But for those watching on video, well, you're going to have some struggle with that because you're going to have to head on over to the podcast format or listen on WZX side to be able to stay in tuned to every single episode because not every episode comes out on video, but you can head on over to your favorite podcasting platform or WZXI and listen every single day to stay up to date on exactly what's going on right here in Kentucky on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show because today we're going to be covering, uh, we got communists, we're going to be talking about communists, um, we've got the budget passed out of the house, we'll be going into that, maybe I'll have time to go over John Dice article uh, you know, if anything, it's a testament to how irrelevant he is that it keeps keeps getting pushed to the bottom and we never have enough time to even go back and reference it. But regardless, we got a big show to us. So make sure you're staying tuned in. Now, if you want to reach out to the show, you can always email the Andrew Cooper Writer Show and me, Andrew Cooper Writer, at info at theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's info at theandrewshow.com. So Brea College has always been a a pretty far left college, generally speaking, overall. I think all of us would agree. Obviously, it was founded to be a liberal arts college, and and its original founding, great, awesome, Uh, a college that was founded to be open to everybody and to specifically help individuals. It was, at the time, it it was founded by an ab... a uh, person who wanted to get rid of slavery, and, and it was half black, half white. Uh, fantastic. But quickly over time, it's morphed into, well, uh, just a hotbed of huge troublesome issues. And that's a real question for a university that calls itself a Christian college. It calls itself that despite if you ask basically any of the students on campus about the Christian doctrine, such as straight monogamous relationships, they would scoff. Now, obviously, Berea University says that, well, they're reaching out to everybody of all faiths, just as God commands it, which is true. We are commanded as Christians, if you're a Christian, to reach out to people of all faiths and beliefs, but you're there to try to convince them, to try to get them to follow the correct path. But Berea College has fallen very short on that. They don't require you follow any kind of Christian path at all based upon uh, the simple idea that, you know, you'd wonder if the people on campus heard what the founder of the university, John G. Fee, back in 1855 when he found the university, if they heard him talk about what he believed in, what he saw that needed to be forwarded in the world, uh, they would probably find themselves aghast. John G. Fee would not even be able to speak on his own university without being kicked off for hate speech. Now, you know this because... John founded uh, Berea College in 1855, and it was called Berea after a town in the Bible. Uh, So definitely a Christian in the years of 1855 would not agree with most of what's going on on campus today. Now, you know, though, who would agree with a lot that's going on Berea's college campus today? Vladimir Lenin, that's right, the Soviet communist uh, pusher. Because on campus, you have a very active chapter called the Berea College Youth Communist League, who regularly hosts events such as this little jam here called the Lenin State and Revolution Reading Club, where you read about Lenin's beliefs and what they think will happen after the fall of the government and society as we know it. Not in a way to say, hey, we should avoid that, but of course, in a way to pull that forward. You know, celebrating Vladimir Lenin, Lenin, who created the very period called the Red Terror, where as many as 3.7 million people died due to his actions, due to his actual ordered executions or the famines that he created all in his bloodthirsty conquest in Russia. But of course, this is an individual that these people on university 
apparently Berea College would celebrate. Now, this group is a college sanctioned group. It even has a faculty advisor named Ezra Lanou, who, according to his LinkedIn, was a member of the student government at Berea and is currently actually looking for a job. Now, what's funny is, is on his LinkedIn, on his, uh, uh, which he's listing as his resume, resume as he's trying to find a job, according to his LinkedIn, he lists a lot of his accomplishments. He talks about co-founding the chess club, co-founding a grassroots students organization to reform Berea's visitation and housing policies into a gender equitable adaptive system that truly included LGBTQIA folks. Now, I wonder if, pause there on that belief system. So, Obviously, uh, before, you know, the college being founded in Christian principles, 1855, they clearly had rules like, you know, men can't go into women's dorms and hang out with one another. And as such, I wonder if uh, old Ezra Lanou's push here was to say, look, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on here with LGBTQIA folks out there, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, everything else. Um, we're going to have to change up our housing things. You see, in, in in the world where you have lesbian and gay and bisexual, well, you can't simply house boys with boys and girls with girls. Uh, we need to change this entire uh, belief system now. Instead of saying that men and women can't stay together on campus, we have to randomly assign roommates now and anybody outside the roommates not allowed into the dorm room. I wonder if that's what he would be pushing for, because if you're trying to stay true to Berea's beliefs while still updating it for LGBTQIA folks, well, then you would want just as many restrictions from girls seeing each other as you want boys and girls from seeing each other. But I've got a feeling that that wasn't what Ezra Lanou was looking for. No, he was probably looking to change policies to encourage these individuals to get it on more and more often, because of course that is the moral wasteful land that Berea college has become. But you know, what's not on his LinkedIn funny enough is the fact that he's the faculty advisor to the communist party group on campus. Now I say, Andrew, this young man deserves freedom of ideas and he absolutely does. But remember, in the marketplace of ideas, we should also have the freedom to call out bad ones and bad thoughts as we see fit. Free speech doesn't mean one person gets to talk and then everyone else has to shut up. A marketplace of ideas, true free speech, means that ideas can battle it out in the public square. We all get to voice our opinions. It doesn't mean just one person. Now, uh, do I think someone like Ezra should face some kind of repercussions from the government for his beliefs? No, no, I don't. I, and, but I do believe in a marketplace of free ideas that employers should be free to decide whether or not they want that kind of Marxist garbage, which is unemployable, involved in their company. Because let's be honest, you don't want somebody who doesn't believe your company deserves to make a profit, somebody who doesn't believe in free govern free markets, somebody who 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 will look at your bottom line and say, well, that doesn't belong to you anyways. That's the type of person that would have no problem stealing from the company they work for because property rights they don't even believe in. No, 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 no. That's not somebody who you'd want on there. So I absolutely believe he does have a right to his free ideas, but I don't think he has a right to be free from repercussions of his bad ideas. You know, but that all my thoughts there are based upon individual citizens. Where it gets hairy is when you start coming into my pockets, into my family's income, and into the fruits of our labor and start using that deadly force of government to steal from us in order to fund your markets indoctrination camps, your, your Marxist indoctrination camps. But we'll go, that's, that's not even the worst thing about this group, though. We'll be going more into the Berea College Communist Party as unfortunate as it sounds, after this short break, you're listening to The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. And you are back with The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Before the break, we were talking about Berea College's Communist Party, a sanctioned group that's a part of the university, even has a faculty advisor. That faculty advisor, and Ezra Lanou, who's currently looking for a job. So if you see somebody come in with that name, perhaps you should think twice before you hire a Marxist. But it's not just that he has beliefs that in the free marketplace of ideas, I don't want him thrown in jail for being a communist, uh, but I do want his ideas called out in the free market of ideas, but I also don't want my money paying for it. And that's where we get into problems here. See, 
people would say, Andrew, you're just calling out some political activist group on campus. Uh, that's not free speech. But keep in mind, Berea College is tuition free after, of course, they get all the money they can from FAFSA, federal application for free student aid, Keys money, Pell grants, the list goes on and on. FAFSA, funded by our tax dollars. You know, you're free to have all the communist clubs you want, but to come and ask for my money to fund it, well, now you've invited in my opinion. And you've invited me now to lobby the government to not outlaw your behavior in general, but to lobby the government to stop funding your behavior. And as if this wasn't bad enough, the Berea College sanctioned Communist Party Group's president and co-founder, I'm going to slaughter this name, is a Yulvi Gatarlyev. Yulvi Gatelyev. Gatelyev. Yulvi Gatelyev. I'm saying it that way because he's a foreign national whose home country as is uh, as, <laughs> I'm going to try here as best I can. Azerbaijan. Ajani. Azerbaijani. Azerbaijani? Yeah. Azerbaijani. I believe I'm saying that right. Okay. Azerbaijani. <laughs> so he's, he's not an American. He uh, is a part of uh, Azerbaijan and that's a former Soviet country. So on top of leading the communist club, the president of it and co-founder, this Yulvi, he also writes in a communist online news website called uh, uh, The Torch, which is a communist website. And he also regularly, it would seem, would appear in protests on behalf of Hamas, supporting Hamas against Israel, calling for a ceasefire, calling for the genocide of all Israelis which is all really great. So you've got a college receiving basically all of its funding through tax dollars, through FAFSA, through keys, through Pell Grants, or other student aids. And on top of that, you still have 38% that are graduating with student loans, but most of those people who are graduating with, with th student loans, those 38% of Berea College students that still graduate, even though it's tuition free with student debt, well, most of their debt is under $5,000. So that means most likely it was just forgiven by Joe Biden. So your tax dollars are funding a university that is importing foreign nationals that are founding communist political party and organizations and then actively campaigning on the behalf of terrorist groups. And yet despite all of this, we have politicians and conservatives unwilling to act on this type of stuff. I mean, I have to ask you, are we suicidal as a country, as a state? I mean, I expect Democrats, I expect liberals to see nothing wrong with importing a bunch of communists uh, and, and a bunch of terrorist sympathizers. I see no problem with that. I mean, half their party at this point in Congress seems like they fall into the category of terrorist sympathizers or uh, potentially terrorists themselves in, in the uh, um, Ilhan Omar based upon her current conversations about her allegiances to Somalia. But I understand, you know, most of them are communist, not most, but probably about half are communists and or uh, socialists. Uh, but I repeat myself, half of them probably don't support Israel. So, so that's expected out of the Democrat Party. I don't expect them to actually take a stand about that. But, but what about our so-called conservative representatives that continue to fund this stuff? And you say, I say, Andrew, what about liberty? Well, liberty is you get to work and think for yourself, yes, but you also have to pay for those consequences yourself. Liberty isn't you get to come to my pocket and steal from me, then use that money to spread your deadly ideologies and import non-Americans that support terrorists. It isn't what liberty is. That is tyranny by another name. And we are allowing them to do it because we as Republicans, we as conservatives are unwilling to do the hard thing and say, oh, you want liberty and freedom. But you don't want Andrew Cooper writer's opinion to matter on your life. Well, then you're cut off. If you don't want my constituents opinion on your beliefs, if you don't want laws made about the way you're conducting yourself and about the fact it is subverting the American way of life, supporting terrorists, supporting communists. Well, you're cut off. 
We're not giving you any more government aid to this stuff completely. No, instead of that, we get Republicans like Michael Adams, Whitney Westerfield, Mitch McConnell, and others that say things like, you're not, we're not going to get distracted by the culture wars. We, we spend too much time on these social issues. They're just good for campaigning. They believe that those issues are unimportant and that we're just going to be the adults in the room. And then they sit there and wonder why our country is going farther and farther less. They will sit there and wonder why, oh, why aren't Republicans winning more elections? Oh, it's Trump's that's the problem. It's not the fact that we're paying to import communist terrorist sympathizers and funding universities that are putting forward communist Lenin <laughs> reading clubs, pro Lenin reading clubs. It's not that we're forwarding that and then having our constituents pay for it. The conservative universities out there, they're not, they're not getting that kind of money. Not the kind of money Berea College is. But they're going to go ahead. We're going to make them pay for it. And then we're going to say, when, when people like me say, hey, this is a problem and I'm paying for it. I want you to do something about it. You tell me not to worry about it. We're being the adults in the room. That's just a sideshow distraction. Well, while you're trying to be the adults in the room, They've barred the doors and are burning the place down. And a country and a state that continues to behave in this way, that doesn't just tolerate things like communism and people who agree more with terrorists than they do their fellow Americans, but funds that will not exist for very long. It just won't. Speaking of out of control, crazy things, the budget uh, passed on Friday. Now, I want to talk a little bit. I want to spend some time talking about this budget and digging into it. So I'm actually going to start that off on the next segment, kind of digging into that budget and everything else. But before I do, a few people reached out emailing me about House Bill 420, who says politicians don't have a sense of humor because, of course, House Bill 420 is a bill to legalize marijuana. The devil's lettuce, the sin cabbage. And I was asked, does it have a chance to pass? Uh, to which I say, no, it does not. No. First, it's sponsored by like all Democrats. Uh, second, you have to understand the nature of politics here in Kentucky. And while perhaps you look at the, the data, the polling data, and you say, well, a majority of people support the legalization of marijuana. Andrew, what do you mean it has no chance to pass? Aren't they listening to the people? They do listen to the people. To a degree, we'll talk more about that when we get into the budget. They listen to the people to the degree, but they they care more about people's perception of it. And you see, the people, the individuals like yourself, who vote, legalizing marijuana. While maybe a majority of voters think that's a good thing, or they're for it, or they have no opinion on it, and we'll go into that here. But it's not a top issue for them. They don't care about that as much as they care about a whole lot of other things. But there is voters out there, especially in the Republican primary, on the other hand, that does have an opinion on not legalizing it that is pretty important to them. So you have to remember, right, the majority of people that get into the ballot box on our down ticket right now, they're just voting R and walking out in the general election. They know nothing about who they're voting for. And then when you move over to the primaries, I'm not saying they know a whole lot about who they're voting for either, but amongst those Republican primary groups, the amount of Republicans whose top issue is legalizing marijuana and really cares about where the reps fall on that is very small and minuscule. So despite the quote unquote popular opinions it has with this majority of voters, the majority of those voters aren't primary voters and the vast majority of those people that are for it, it's not a top issue for them. They can take it or leave it. They don't really care. And so you have not only, politically speaking, only things to lose, nothing to gain. That's just the politics of it, okay? Let's talk about, like, the actual, like, mechanics of it. Because before we even really dig into and discuss whether or not legalizing marijuana in Kentucky would be a good thing or a bad thing just in general, and, and before we can have a debate on those merits, and I think it'd be a very robust debate that we could dig into, about whether you can say this is a freedom issue, so on and so forth, and I get that, but there's a lot of points in legislation, both federally and then something to deal with statewide that would need to be discussed. First, marijuana being federally illegal, 
still leads to a lot of issues specifically with banking. FDIC insured banks can't do business with cannabis growers, weed dealers. And, um, you know, that means that they're unbanked and that can manifest itself in a lot of weird ways. One time I was out campaigning, knocking doors and I came across a Republican that was a uh, fertilizer salesman. He owned a fertilizer business. And he told me about the time that he sold a boatload of fertilizer to a pot farm out West and they had to pay him in cash and an armored truck had to show up with like $250,000 on it. And he had to have that truck drive down to his bank and deposit it. But he had no, no way to really document that. And that's what leads to some of this marijuana legalizing to also uh, have a lot more organized crime with it because there's so much cash going on that it makes it ideal for, uh, you know, washing money for, for money laundering operations. I just listened to a really interesting Stephen Crowder episode on the Oklahoma pot trade ever since it's been legalized their crime and organized crime especially is just skyrocketed uh due to this due to the attraction that comes of these other businesses things we should all be against like sex trafficking well now they can come into states where marijuana is legal and have a better access to washing their funds because you have a business that is cash based and it's not unheard of to be moving large amounts of cash but there's one other thing to discuss on this before we go into the budget, I'll be talking about that after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Kuberider Show. And you are back with The Andrew Kuberider Show. Want to reach out to the show? Feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. Before the break, we were talking about House Bill 420, aptly named bill that is trying to legalize marijuana in Kentucky, the devil's lettuce. And I was talking about some things that we really should probably deal with before we have this discussion uh, one was, of course, about federally it's still illegal, so that creates issues mainly with banking, uh, and that can really create a hotbed of criminal activity to happen besides marijuana because of the money laundering opportunities that that kind of heavy cash flow business offers. But the other thing that uh, is worth discussing on this when it comes to legalizing marijuana state ride, just on a practical standpoint here, guys, you know, alcohol isn't even legalized completely statewide. I mean, we still have wet and dry votes in counties and cities all across Kentucky all the time. There's just a wet dry vote and a, and a, like a precinct of Louisville and it went dry. And so, I mean, here's the thing, you got something that's still federally legal and you want the state to come in and force legalization of it on everyone in the state. Meanwhile, we haven't even done that with alcohol yet. Something that's been around in the state for a very long time has, has, has been basically since a prohibition unregulated outside of age buying the same way they'd say they want marijuana regulated for now near 100 years here in Kentucky straight. And we don't even have that legal everywhere in Kentucky. And, and you're going to force down marijuana legalization everywhere. I, I think you're barking up the wrong tree there. I think if you really want to have a real discussion about this, those people that are forwarding this kind of thing, they first got to start by uh, one, the federal government's got to, got to legalize it. And then two, you got to put forward an option for local places to decide whether or not they want this in their community. And even then we can start having a real debate about the merits of it. I'm not saying I'm for it uh, at all by any means. I'm saying I'm against it by any means. I think it's a lot of discussion. I don't think it's necessarily a net positive for society. Of course, there is some freedom issues, but that's that's a worthwhile debate, something to talk about. But to sit there and say we need to have that discussion before it's legal federally, so it's unbanked, creating you know all kinds of criminal activity, and then two, like I said, alcohol is not even legal statewide. You're going to force down marijuana and everybody. Come on now, come on. Seems seems a little out of control. So the budget passed the House. Uh, part of its first step here, and, and there's a lot to go into about the budget process and everything else. I'm going to call it now. This is going to take so long. Uh, this segment, next segment, will probably be dedicated to talking about the budget. So this John Dyth article just had to wait another day. That's how irrelevant he is. Just keeps getting pushed off. I've had a segment actually notes wrote about this John Dyth article where he went after McConnell, but not for the same reasons you and I would probably go after McConnell. And I can't manage to find the time to cover it. Uh, so an, such an unimportant person. Anyways, so um, the budget passed the House. And as it sits, as it's coming out of the House, it's $74,605,016,800 for this next fiscal year. For comparison, our current fiscal year that we are in 
which is this year's budget, last year's budget, I think, whatever, however you want to say it, but this year's budget that we're in is 48 million, 200, or $48,232,127,900. That's an increase of about $26 billion year over year. That's almost a 50% increase. And a good chunk of it is coming from capital projects, which is about 15 billion more than normal. The question is, where is that 15 billion capital projects money coming from? I mean, honestly, where is it coming from? I'm not here to answer that question to you because I don't know. And neither does anybody else, it seems like. Because here's the thing, you, there's no revenue bill out there yet, okay? So this is the spending bill, but they haven't shown us a revenue bill to show us the money that they think is coming into the general fund and as such. So we don't actually know fully where each of these dollars are coming from line item out. So I can't go find it on my own. You can't find it on your own. Now, I do have something that a lot of you probably don't. I can reach out to legislators. I know a good amount of them. And uh, before recording this, I called about 15 state reps and senators, as well as a political reporter. Uh, I spoke with about half of them that I called. Uh, I know some of them have called me back since I've even been sitting here talking, but I'm not going to, uh, uh, of course, interrupt myself in my middle of my train of thought to take their call. Um, but so I've talked to about seven, eight legislators, one of which is on the Appropriations and Revenue Committee, the committee that makes the bill, and a political reporter. And guess what? Nobody can tell me where the $14 billion. Now, normally, you'll see like $55 million in capital projects set aside in restricted funds. But for some reason, this year's budget has $14 billion set aside in capital funds, in, in the capital uh, uh, budget. Capital expenditures, so that's like buildings, infrastructure, those kinds of things. And the capital projects budget, $14 billion in restricted funds, and nobody can tell me where it's coming from, and I can't figure out where physically, where is that money coming from? Is it debt? Is it bonds? Is it loans? Is it public-private partnerships? Is it federal funds? They don't know. I mean, let me say that again. We have a bill that passed out of our house spending $74 billion, $26 billion more than the prior year, this budget bill. And I just zeroed in on $14 billion of it. $14 billion, that's a pretty sizable chunk of seven, $74 billion. That's, that's 20%. So I zeroed in on 20% of the budget and asked a lot of legislators, where's this money coming from? Who's funding this? How, how are we paying for this? Because I don't see the revenue streams and it's not coming from the general fund. That's where our taxes go into. So who's paying for this? How are we paying for it? Are we going 15, 14 billion in debt? And they can't answer it to which leads me the question, how did we pass a house? How did the house pass a budget bill where nobody, including members of the appropriations and revenue committee that I talked to, I talked, like I said, I talked to a good number. Enough legislators that somebody should be able to answer that question. And not a single one I talked to could answer that question. Now, not everyone I talked to voted yes on it, but a few did. And I think that points to just how broken our entire legislative process is. Just how broken it is. It's funny, when I talked to one of these people, they said, I don't know a whole lot about the budget, but I do know it's one of the most conservative budgets we've ever passed. To which I say, they say that every year, and, and to which I say this, and, and I said this uh, to the person as well, I said, it is $26 billion more than the prior year, a 50% increase in budget. How would you describe that as conservative? I mean, I take aside the $14 billion, which people don't know where it's coming from. So let's assume somehow it's not coming from debt at all. The budget alone has $3.5 billion in new debt being issued in bonds. That's loans put out through bonds. That's, that's the bond fund and the agency bond line items in this budget total $3.5 billion. That is new debt that has to be paid back. This isn't a conservative budget. 
putting us three and a half billion in debt at least, if not several billion more up to, it could be up to 17 and a half billion in debt, but at least 3.5, well, we got to figure out where this 14 billion is coming from. Is it debt, federal funds, bonds, loans? I don't know and nobody does. Nobody does. It's flabbergasting. I'm talking people whose job it is to know these things don't know. How does this pass? It's because our political system is broken. And you know what? Who's to blame? It's not the politicians. It's us. We are to blame. And I'm going to go into this process. I'm going to go into this budgeting process, this bill process, how the budget gets made, and exactly why it is our fault that our politicians continue to do this, continue to spin like this, continue to spend us into billions of dollars of debt, even at the state level, let alone at the national level. I'll go into why that keeps happening right after this short break. You listen to the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Want to reach out to the show? Feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. We'll be back after this short break. And you're back with the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. For the break, I was going over the budget. $14 billion in spending that's being funded by I don't know where, and apparently neither does any legislator or political reporter that I talked to. But we do know it does do at least $3.5 billion in debt. Nothing about this budget is truly conservative. You can't say that when you're going billions of dollars into debt. Uh, either we are fiscal conservatives that don't believe in debt or we aren't. Apparently, we aren't is what I'm getting. But the reason why so many of these legislators, even ones that when I call up and ask this question, they can't answer it. The reason why they still voted yes for it is because our political system is broken and it's your fault. It's my fault. It's the voters' fault. It's in how we vote. Let me, let me first explain how this budget bill even gets made. So a committee makes it. Um, it's a larger committee. They have committee hearings. But realistically speaking, you know, the chair, the vice chair, a few others really kind of sit down. They hash out a lot of it as well as with support staff from the Legislative Research Commission. They go through it, and then they also have then public hearings, the a &R committee hearings, and those are the hearings that the other members of the Appropriations and Revenue Committee get to sit in on and ask those questions. And they can ask questions about those they're asking for hearings from, but there's not a lot of discussion. Then they put out and they publish the budget. They published this one a few weeks ago. Now, those longtime listeners, and by long time, I mean just a few weeks, listeners, know that I took some time to dig through the budget and call out a few million dollars in spending that I thought was out of control. By a few million, I believe is about 10 million. But I didn't really go over the final number or this much in debt. And the reason why is because so often when they put forward budget bills, they will just throw everything into it, a whole smorgasbord of everything they possibly want to fund they'll throw into a pile. And then uh, things get paired out of it through the committee sub process, the committee process, so on and so forth. And so this budget bill as proposed wasn't the final draft. So the things I called out were all things that uh, they had always priorly funded that were worth calling out now, but I didn't go into the actual debt side of it or this 14 billion part of it um, because it wasn't finalized. Well, on Thursday, the a &R committee took a vote to approve the committee sub and it got pushed forward. But the committee sub wasn't actually available to the public until about Saturday after the House had already voted yes on it. Why? Because the committee finished it the night before. They vote yes. It gets published, uh, uh, put to the floor. The, in fact, the, the legislators who voted on the bill on the floor they just got it in about 30 minutes beforehand. It's a 257 page document. And they got it 30 minutes before they head out onto the floor and have to decide whether or not to vote yes or no on it. So that's the first part of the problem in the process here. We don't do individual budget bills to uh, uh, fund individual departments. They don't have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an attorney general department bill, an ag department bill, a department of, uh, you know, Social Security, a Department of, you know, Cabinet for Health and Family Services, State Park. It's not individualized bills. It's one big omnibus spending package that gets passed every two years. And you wonder why that happens. I mean, they only pass a budget every two years. They have literally two years to prepare this budget and they don't do it. And that is because 
quite frankly, most of these legislators are very also lazy and they don't really see ahead very well. They're, they're very much so they live in the moment, it's just the nature of what they do. So they don't really start working on the budget until a few months before session. So this bill gets published. It's got everything in it. Then the committee subs, so the actual budget bill gets subbed out and voted on in committee. Then the next day they're voting it on the floor and our reps have had 30 minutes to look at it. And we, the citizenry ha can't even access it. We don't even get to see it. I couldn't see. They were actively voting on the floor on a budget and I couldn't see what the budget bill actually was that they were voting on because it wasn't published to the public yet which is wrong. All of that's wrong. And it also didn't even allow for a amendment process. You know, people couldn't propose amendments. The Democrats tried to propose amendments. Those got voted down because it didn't follow the House rules because amendments had to be published, uh, I believe, at least 24 hours to be voted on. But because the House bill was just finished less than 24 hours before, you couldn't even file those uh, amendments. Big part of the problem, isn't it? Absolutely it is. So that leaves these politicians with a choice. And this is where electoral politics comes into play. And this is why it's our fault. It's our fault. So in this budget, for an example, there's a line item that pays for body armor grants for police. And it's all part of this giant budget. So if you voted no on the budget, your primary opponent or your Democrat opponent in the general or your primary opponent and the primary can run a, a postcard, can run an ad saying that they back the blue, you don't because you refuse to vote yes on funding body armor for police. They can run an ad that says that and it would technically legally be accurate. And you would buy it. Not you, maybe not you. You might be more intelligent because you're listening to this show. But voters as a whole would buy it. They'd be like, yeah, that's, I guess that's true. And then they go and they ask the legislator about it. When they're going to say it was all part of this budget deal that was putting us $3.5 billion in debt. So I voted no. I say, okay, that would kind of neutralize it for most voters, but you got to get that word out. And honestly, if, if you're looking at this budget saying it's putting us at least $3.5 billion in debt, this most conservative budget ever, <laughs> $3.5 billion in debt, new debt, new bonds being issued. And then a person attacks you for voting no on that. Well, what they're saying is that they would spend the money, but they remember that. They remember that they attacked you for not voting yes on the budget bill, the big omnibus package. And so if they win that primary election time comes along and now you have somebody that's going to rubber stamp any single bill that comes through the house, that's a budget bill because they don't want the same thing they did to somebody to happen to them. So they'll vote for more and more funding, more and more debt, because there's one thing in the bill that looks really good. And if you vote no, you can now get attacked for doing it. And because we as voters don't do our research, this is what we get. We get the government we deserve. And this is the government we deserve. The kind of government that spends $26 billion more dollars than it did last year. The kind of government that's going $3.5 billion in debt at least. The kind of government, the kind of legislature that votes yes on a bill that has $14 billion of spending in it that none of them know how it gets funded to begin with. And yet, it can pass our house, no problem. Flying colors. No problem flying, flying callers. Basically, every single Republican voted yes other than a few. A lot of Democrats voted no, but that's because they wanted more spending. And he has no problem. No problem at all. Because nobody wants an attack ad read against them saying you voted no for body armor for police. That's exactly what happens because we let our votes be bought by a dumb ad and a dumb postcard. And we believe it. It's not exactly our fault. We're pretty busy. We trust others to farm it out, farm out our beliefs. But maybe that's why we should stay more informed. Maybe that's why you should listen to the show more often and share it with others. So we can explain this process for you because I don't envy those legislators. It's easy for me to sit here and say, you should have voted no. It's got billions of dollars of debt in it. It's easy for me to say my head's not on the chopping block in a primary. But. Theirs is, a lot of them's ours. They vote no, they're going to pay for it. And leadership has ordained 
these bills. So if you vote no on it too, you could see that some of your own pet project bills that you want to get pushed forward, they don't. They don't make it. Now, this isn't the final vote though. So this will now head over to the Senate. The Senate will make it changes. They'll vote to pass their version. And then they'll have a conference committee where both A&R committees meet, parse out what parts of the bill that they want to leave in, want to take out, yada, yada, yada. And then that gets put forward into the final budget bill. And then that will be what actually ends up funding our government. Though I tell you what, it's, I, I don't think it's going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And I would challenge every single representative out there that's listening to this, every single one I talked to, I told them this. Find out where that $14 billion is coming from. Is it debt? Is it federal funds? Is it not? It should be easy to vote no for a budget. Already, it should have been easy to vote no for a budget, putting us $3.5 billion more in debt. If that $14 billion is just more debt, that now is a bill putting us $17.5 billion in debt. $17.5 billion, increasing our debt more than 25%. That should be an easy no vote for any conservative at all with principle. But unfortunately, even if that turns out to be debt, you may find out that many will still just vote yes for it. Well, y'all, that's all we got time for today on the Andrew Cooper Show. Make sure you're joining back here tomorrow, WZXI or in the podcast format. Have a great day.